Hi there and welcome to another interview. Today I've got the fabulous Dr. Abs with me, who may be someone you've never heard of before, but we had him on our 24-hour live stream and boy, did it light up the live chat. So anyway, I'm going to ask Dr. Abs the same question I ask absolutely every guest. Hey, Dr. Abs, why did you become carnivore? Um, thank you for having me, first of all. I'm very, very humbled that someone would think I'm, I'm worth interviewing and, and have something interesting to say. And uh, the live stream was amazing. I stayed up for nearly all of it. Unfortunately, I didn't manage all of it, but uh, it was definitely worth staying up for. Um, so I became carnivore because, put simply because of health reasons. I, I think it's absolutely the most species appropriate diet. Uh, my journey into it is is pretty much the same journey into what I do for a living now. Um, so I am a, a cosmetic doctor and a longevity doctor. Um, longevity is not a recognized specialism, but I say that just because it's the easiest way to understand what I'm, I'm trying to do that's all um and i got here because i originally a long time ago was actually a dentist um but i was always interested in the body as a whole because my, my dad was a doctor um but when i was about seven i started learning about the nervous system and the circulation system and things um and then i noticed you know that when they teach brushing technique when i was a dental student I, it didn't make sense to me because some people didn't brush their teeth but they had no tooth decay other people brush really well and they had loads of tooth decay and gum disease and i thought what the hell is going on? Like this, this doesn't make any sense. And that was the first question mark. I never questioned it because I got taught not to question people. Basically at university, I didn't have a great time, but then as time went on, as I graduated and, and looked into all these things, I noticed that people with more teeth had better health when they were in their sixties, seventies, eighties. And I thought, well, that can't be a coincidence. And it does make logical sense. Like animals in the wild, no teeth, you can't eat, you're done. Like, and I got that. Then I started looking into people like Weston Price, which I'm sure quite a few people, if not everyone in, in the carnivore community has heard of. He was also a dentist, which so I connected with him. Then I ended up looking into nutrition, which led me into obesity, which led me into met metabolism, which led me into mitochondria, which led me into longevity, because it's all the same thing. So I'm not a practicing dentist anymore. Um, but for me, what I do, cosmetic medicine, longevity medicine, it's the same thing. I know it sounds odd to say, but if your cells are functioning really well, you're going to look really well. If your cells are really struggling to do anything and they're terrible, you're going to look terrible as well. So that's what I do. I, you know, I teach medicine and, and, and in both these contexts around the world to hospitals, clinics, companies, medical authorities, um, et cetera, et cetera. I have, my, I have my own patients. I treat quite a lot of professional athletes, you know, pro professional footballers, cricketers, boxers, all that kind of thing as well as general patients who want to treat disease like diabetes, PCOS, obesity, all these kind of things as well. So YouTube was a bit of fun and it's gotten a bit out of control, but um, it's a good out of control, I think. So that's where we are. That's how I, I got to do what I do for a living. And, and that's why I, I became carnivore as well. Was there any particular gateway influences that persuaded you down that carnivore path? Um, I would say no particular influences individually. Um, but just the, the knowledge that this was a growing community made me look at lots of different things and made me look at, you know, the Harvard study with, with 2000, roughly 2029 carnivores or whatever. And, and yeah, if I had to pick one influencer for me, it would probably be Western Price, actually, which is very old school. But it shows you what living off the land, living like our ancestors, it can do for you as a, as a person. Yeah. Uh, Western A. Price is... Um... Instagram is fantastic and it's full of good information. It's bite-sized, no pun intended. And I do think that um, dentistry is uh, is an interesting area because we've got Dr. Kevin Stock, who is uh, a great advocate for carnivore. And he often talks about how the mouth gives you clues, your teeth, your health, in your um, in the way you buy everything, your tongue, your, whether you've got crowded teeth, are all big clues into the way we're eating being the wrong way because uh, in the wild, like you say, or some sort of tribes, when you look at them, their teeth are fantastic. When you look at ancient remains, the teeth are fantastic. So obviously something in the last hundred years has gone a bit wrong. Uh, just a little aside, uh, I'm a big Monty Python fan and uh, the guy that was the director there, he realised he got it wrong with the teeth. He said, when I ever do anything set in the past, I always used to make their teeth horrible. And then I learnt that actually that was probably not really the case, that horrible teeth is a is a disease of sugar and a modern way of living and that sort of thing. So anyway, that's great. So you, you looked at carnivore. So how long have you been carnivore? So I've been keto inadvertently for a long time, probably most of my life, to be honest, because I just love meat. 
um, in terms of actually proper strict carnivore join the club here's your card I would say probably since earlier uh, start of this year start of 2024 roughly speaking um, so I was never in bad shape but I've just gone to another level now and I feel absolutely incredible now that I'm doing it full time yeah what, what was the tweaks that you were looking for then in, in your health so there was no particular problem that I was trying to treat I'm I'm the sort of personality where if I'm going to do something I want to be the best that's all it is. So if I'm going to try and be healthy, I want to be as healthy as possible, not just play at it or, or do a little bit. And the reason I was keto for most of my life is just because I was eating intuitively. I just liked me and, 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 and that was it. And I thought I was doing the best and I thought there was no you know step up from there until obviously I dug into things more and more and, and I realized there was a step up. So I took it. Yeah. And now you, you touched on something that has actually happened to me as well when you were talking about not questioning brushing technique when i did my specialism in obesity and diabetes i questioned eating carbohydrates because it just seemed like all the medication dosage and all the advice was around carbohydrate management and i got laughed out of the building basically well you've got to eat carbohydrates so i really that really did resonate with me um you're now talking about longevity as uh, and uh, cosmetic uh, specialism. So I want to talk about longevity first. How did you get into that field and, and what would you say are a couple of sort of biohacks that might help people live longer and health in a more healthy way as well, actually? It's not just about getting that number up, is it? It's about the health that goes with it. Yeah, it came because of, of this sort of stepping stone sequence. When I started to look into, you know, more teeth equals better health, then I, they took me into diet. And then from there, naturally went into metabolism and, and and how we actually process substrates, the three main macronutrients. And then when I understood that and went into the mitochondria, then I understood things like cell repair mechanisms uh, and, you know, mTOR complexes and, and, and things like that. And that inevitably is, you know, at the end of the day, that's what longevity is. We, we, we're trying to figure out how to optimize all the cell functions. So I just found myself in there. It wasn't, it wasn't um, something I specifically aimed for. Now, in terms of how people can take advantage of that, the first thing I would always say to people, don't fall for snake oil. You know, so many people sell so many treatments and supplements that say, oh, this will make you live longer. Actually, nothing has been proved to make anyone live longer. That is the absolute truth. There have been no studies on genetically identical twins where only one thing has changed and one of them has lived longer than the other. You, you will never prove it. But what I would say is the most anti-aging thing anyone can do is simply to eat right eat species appropriate, make appropriate lifestyle choices. It's not going to cost you anything, which is why big companies aren't going to sell that to you because they want to sell you something they can sell. They want to sell you a treatment, a pill, a tablet. It's something you, you pay for. A uh, species appropriate diet is not going to cost you a huge amount, but that's the number one thing. After that, you want to make sure that you're exercising appropriately. Again, not something that costs a huge amount of money. Um, but you want to make sure you focus on both muscle mass because that is a big, big factor in, in longevity because muscle mass accounts for the numbers of mitochondria in your body, mitochondrial biogenesis, your baseline metabolic rate. You also want to work on strength. Um, you want to be making sure that your electrical impulse generation ability, shall we say, is, is appropriate and you don't lose that as you get older. People that are frail and very, very thin and, and have sarcopenia, are you wearing away of skeletal muscle when they're older? Their immune system is far, far worse and they have so many more issues. Sarcopenia is a big, big problem. So a diet, your exercise, getting decent sleep all the time, not just quantity, but quality as well. Um, they're probably the three biggest things that people can do in terms of a top three. And surprise, surprise, none of them are not things that you buy. Uh, none of them are things that you buy, you know, and, and, and that's the key take home message. Don't get forward into spending loads of money for it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I think that was a fascinating answer. And you slipped in a couple of bits, um, some terminology that scares people. So I'm going to pick up on that. My podcast doesn't get too sciencey, but I'm happy for you to go down this route because when people talk about longevity, there's a lot of scaremongering about a few things. The easy bit to ask you about is the volume of food because there's a big thing about keeping the volume of food down makes you live longer. Avoiding protein, there's another one about that. And mTOR. So for the lay people who might have heard of mTOR and thought, well, that, I'm sure that's a scary thing. Uh, could you talk about what mTOR actually is and then address 
uh, your understanding of, of why there is scaremongering around protein and actually simply eating enough food. Yeah. So I think all of those things, all those three things, the volume of food, protein, and mTOR, the, the key thing for lay people to understand is they're not necessarily three separate things. They're all related. You're kind of looking at the same thing from a different perspective, uh, a perspective of, of a nutritionist versus a biochemist and something else. That's all. Uh, and that's the key. That's why people think, well, how do you know about this if you're doing cosmetic? Or how do you know about that if you're doing longevity? It's the same thing. Biochemically, I'm sure if Richard was here, he would agree with me. It's the same thing. Um, so mTOR, I'll start with mTOR and then I'll work backwards from there because it makes more sense going from that. So mTOR is it's a, it's a pathway, okay? It stands for, depending on what you read, mechanistic target of rapamycin. Um, and, and rapamycin is, is something else. We can go into that if needed. It's, it's, a, it's a drug. Um, mTOR, it's, it's a protein kinase, and it's got a central role in, in regulating the growth of cells, the multiplication of cells, the metabolism of our cells, i.e. the mitochondria, and actually, ultimately, as a result of all that, whether the cell survives or not, or, or dies. And so, if we look into all those different things, so if you look at cell growth and proliferation, mTOR can promote things like anabolic processes, processes which build things like protein synthesis, fat synthesis, or lipid sy synthesis, things which are, are essential for the growth and the, and the multiplication of the cell. Um, if you look at the metabolic aspect of mTOR, uh, that again regulates pretty much the entire metabolic process, including glucose metabolism, uh, as well as general mitochondrial function. It can also help in something called autophagy, um, which is a... Um, you know, it, it, it can inhibit autophagy, which is where, which is where it can kind of degrade and recycle components of the cell, um, and then it can help you in your immune response as well. So the differentiation of cells and, and the function of the immune cells too. And we've got two versions of it. We've got complex one and complex two. Now they will work slightly differently from each other and they regulate slightly different things. So complex one will respond to things like nutrients based on, are you, in other words, what you're eating in, in layman's terms. Uh, it can respond to growth factors. Um, it can respond to the energy status. And it can promote protein synthesis by activating other things, which if people are interested and want to look something up, things like S6K1 and inhibit things like 4EBP1. Um, and it can inhibit autophagy by phosphorylating ULK1 as well. Then you've got mTOR complex 2. Again, activated by growth factors, regulates the cytoskeleton, the structure of the cell, the actin in the cytoskeleton, the survival of the cell, the metabolism of the cell, and even through things like signaling through certain molecules like AKT. So it's used in a heck of a lot of different things. Um, one of the reasons I look into it quite a lot is because there's one particular pathway that mTOR complex one is involved with, which is highly respondent to amino acids. And the reason I'm saying that I know people think I'm going a bit too deep, but the reason I'm saying that is because amino acids come from where? Protein, which is what you eat in your diet. So they're all that's why they're all very, very similar. They all respond to the same thing. And so you have to have enough protein to allow the metabolism to actually work. And you know, about 70% of you, roughly speaking, is water. About 17%, the next biggest thing is protein. So protein is the second biggest component of our entire species like as an organism that's what we're, we're mostly made of outside of water and so getting enough protein is important for that very reason it's like trying to build a house with not enough bricks you're just gonna have a big hole in the wall somewhere right and and that's it's as simple as that in terms of how much protein which is obviously another thing that you asked that is what we have the feelings of hunger and satiety for and it's it's as simple as that your body will know how much it needs if you are training regularly it will just make you hungrier more often and it will take longer to make you feel full. That's it. And we just need to listen to those. There's no such thing as, in, in nature that is, there's no such thing as three meals a day or breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I mean, it makes no sense. How can one meal be more important than another when the purpose of all meals is the same thing? You know, yeah. um, hopefully that answers all three without again going too deep. Yeah, well, they're, they're great answers. And I'm smiling my face off here And for those people that are on the video. And uh if you're on the audio podcast, I, I do want to say, Dr. Trabs, I have no idea how old you are, but you look like a great advert for Carnival. Um, 31. <laughs> 31, right. Okay, cool. Well, uh, a relative newbie, so I'm nearly twice as old as you. So let's have a look at this um, 
scaremongering area because I, I think it's great to have doctors on and talk about things that worry others about starting this way of eating. If you don't mind, let's just close down some of those things. So sure. cholesterol. If you eat this way, it's going to put your cholesterol up. Well, it's going to put your LDL cholesterol up, and that's bad for your heart. That's what they say. Uh, what would you say to someone that's worried about that? So what I would say to people, instead of talking directly about cholesterol, initially, I would try to give people the perspective to view cholesterol through, and then it makes more sense. The, the perspective of viewing cholesterol is the same perspective that you use to view your ability to respond to insulin your ability to have this hormone level or that hormone level. In other words, your body is setting the rate of these things because that is the best thing it needs to do in that moment for maximum chances of survival. I'm going to go slightly off topic, only for an analogy, and then come back onto topic. So some people think insulin resistance is a problem. It has actually saved your life by making you stop responding to insulin. So I, I did a video on this recently on my channel and I, said, and I used it two analogies. The first analogy was Bruce from the film Matilda, who was forced to eat loads and loads of chocolate cake. It's probably a dream for most of us, but you know he was eating loads and loads and loads and loads. And then what happened? His body made him feel sick. So he had to stop. That's not your body malfunctioning. It's saving you. Okay. And I'm sure we would all agree with that. Then if you look at a battery, you charge it to 100% it stops the charge coming in. It's not broken, it's a safety mechanism. If it kept coming in, it'd catch on fire and explode probably. Our cells are the same thing, okay? Your cell is not, can't you know, make you fall off your chair feeling sick like it did to Bruce, because it's a cell, but it can stop more energy coming in. Just like on an organismal level, Bruce's brain modified his behavior to make him stop putting cake in his mouth. Your cell can modify what comes in and out for the exact same reason. So a perspective on that is, oh, it's a problem. We've, we've got to force the insulin response. No, it's doing that for a reason. And I think it makes sense when you look at it this way. And so when you transfer that analogy to cholesterol, it's the same principle. Your body is doing that for a reason. So it is, it is it's shuttling around cholesterol because it is needed. Or something. These are what we call dependent variables. So you go about living your life, eating what you're eating, exercising, sleeping, social connections, all these important things, and your body will then decide what the best thing internally it needs to do to adapt to that situation. So here's a clue. Everything that is not in your conscious control, like ability to respond to insulin, like cholesterol level, to, to keep the analogies going, they are all your body modifying internal subconscious or, or non-conscious things to adapt itself for maximum survivability based on your actions, based on your phenotype, i.e. your real world reality, day-to-day -day life choices. So it's not necessarily that you should be trying to control cholesterol. It's that you should be getting the right diet, getting good sleep, exercise, getting sunshine on your skin, et cetera, et cetera. And your cholesterol will take care of itself. Now, cholesterol is kind of like a repair mechanism. Once we have damage to the vessel lining, for example, in times of hypertension, high blood pressure, the, the pressure can damage the lining in the same way that repeated punches to the face in a boxing match can then cause uh, swelling and, and, and cuts in the skin. The high pressure, when it hits certain parts of the circulation system, the aorta is under the biggest pressure because that's the first bit the blood enters straight out of the heart so you're going to get the maximum pressure there when the blood hits that curvature of the aorta and it goes all the way around that first point of contact has the most pressure there's no coincidence that we can find issues with the vessels in places like this where we get the biggest punches to the face and so cholesterol is, is something that's there because it can fit into that gap and actually help repair what what is a lot of the cell membrane made of cholesterol and what have we sent there to repair and to repair the membranes? Cholesterol. No coincidence. You know, if you've got a, a, a damaged car, you know, and you need a new headlight, a mechanic turns up with a headlight. Doesn't mean there's there's a problem. Doesn't mean that anything has gone wrong. They're with, they're there with the replacement. Cholesterol is there with the replacement to try and repair what's what's been damaged. So it's not cholesterol that you need to worry about. It's your day to day life choices. It's your medical conditions that have come about as a result of your day-to-day -day life choices. Control those, your body will take care of itself. 
people are interested, my cholesterol, I think it's between 6.5 and 7 millimoles per litre. In American, that's about 265-ish. Am I bothered? Not in the slightest. Yeah, I, I'm going to just applaud you for that because I, I'm a big fan of analogies and making things simple. And also, I go for the common sense because a lot of people will say to me, I don't understand my doctor's got my blood and uh, wants me on statins and absolutely hates the results. But I don't understand because my blood pressure has lowered and it's really good. My body composition, I've lost 30 pounds. My HDL cholesterol has gone up. My good cholesterol, my blood glucose has gone down. My energy is better. I'm sleeping better. I'm moving more. And my LDL has gone up. And I'm thinking, right, okay, why would one marker get worse when all the other ones are getting better? Maybe it goes up because it should be going up. And we have got it all wrong. And I, I, it's the human construct or someone's opinion that this is high in inverted commas because that's the standard duty of care. The normal ranges on blood are not set on somebody eating this way. They're set on people eating 60% carbohydrates and uh, they're wrong. I mean, the normative ranges are wrong and um, full of opinion. And uh, anyway, right, I'm not going to rant. I don't want to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, so this this might be interesting to your viewers as, because they don't necessarily get to hear what happens inside hospitals. I remember once when I was in school and my dad was talking to one of his friends slash colleagues and they were talking about the fact that there were new people in the powers that be above the hospital talking about changing the reference ranges for what we class as diabetes. And I, I didn't understand it at the time, but I remember the conversation very clearly. And my dad's friend was saying, that's that's nonsense. That doesn't, if, if they're there, wherever there was, it doesn't mean they're diabetic. It just means it's easier to classify them as someone that needs the drugs of that company. That's all it's for. And I remember it so well. I still remember who, who, who it was and I, and I still know, who, you know where they are. And they said that, and, and that was the first time in my life I realized medicine isn't about healing people and, and, and helping people. Medicine has been hijacked by, not all, not everyone, and it's not all like this, but in parts, at least, it has been hijacked simply to line the pockets of, of Big Pharma. Now, I understand that there has to be a profit. I'm not against capitalism because we all want to make a living. We want to feed our families. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. But the pharma industry, I suspect, is not necessarily interested in keeping it in that way um, based on what I have personally seen with, with my own two eyes. Well, I agree. I mean, only this morning I was coaching someone and for five years I've been coaching this person because they got through a really traumatic, serious uh, cancer and some other events and they just like seeing me every week. And every every week we do the blood pressure and every week it's uh, he's got one of those machines that says your blood pressure is optimal, your blood pressure is da da So we, you know, I've sort of explained that 120 over 80 is not a medical... Uh, medically set limit is a uh, a parameter that you'd expect someone in their 20s to have, roughly speaking, and that blood pressure is dynamic depending on how hot and cold it is. So we've got all this stuff. There's a point to this, by the way. Um, and more often than not, it says it's optimal, um, but sometimes it's a little bit more and sometimes it's a little bit higher. And I say, look, are you cold? What have you just done? What's your activity? Oh, I've just walked up to such and such and all this. So well, it's going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be because you need more delivery of nutrients. I'm not worried about that. Well, anyway, he went into Boots over the weekend, got a blood pressure reading. I think it was 127 over 87. And they have basically said, right, you need to do this every single day for the next seven days. You need to speak to your doctor about blood pressure medication. And he said, I told them I got somebody that does this. Um, and they didn't want to know. And I'm old enough uh, to have the age-related blood pressure readings in a textbook. And at his age, actually, it's perfectly fine because your arteries stiffen. And in the 1950s, I'm not saying I was in the 1950s, but I've got books from that era. And there is, you know, if you're in your 60s, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's something like 139 over, or if it's 139, it'd probably be about 98 or something like that. Um, so it's, it's interesting that they used to do it age-related, which makes a lot more sense. Why would I have the same blood pressure as someone who's 20? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. So, right. Um, so what about this thing now where I think the mainstream media, maybe Big Pharma has got onto us about LDL and 
saying, you know, at least half the people have a heart attack have either normal or low LDL. We now know about uh, lipoprotein little a or LP little a. What, what do you make of all this tr different ways of breaking down the same information? I think when it comes through the media, people have to realize that the media's sole job is to generate advertising revenue. And that's all it's there for. So it is not in their best interest to give accurate material necessarily. Obviously, some, some, sometimes they will. I'm, I'm sure they will. But mostly it's there to make money advertising. Okay, it's it's like YouTube on steroids. A lot of YouTube is you know, title and thumbnail combination that you, I'm sure you'd have to learn. You, you have to get people to want to watch your video. But in the media, that's pretty much all it is. And another problem with the media is you never have enough time to go through things in detail. I mean, look at this interview we're doing. We've got time to go through proper answers. In the media, you might have a 30-second soundbite. So we'll never really pay any attention to what they say in terms of looking at these other markers, LP, little a, um, Again, these are dependent variables. So these are things your body is controlling without your conscious control in order to make the best of the situation. So I would look at that in the same way that I look at um, LDL cholesterol, which is it doesn't change what you need to do, which is eat right, exercise right, get sunshine, sleep well, etc cetera, etc cetera, and it will take care of itself absolutely uh common sense now talking about youtube i deliberately looked at your youtube and looked at some of the thumbnails that jumped out at me and i find that one of them in particular interesting uh where you mentioned vitamin d3 heart attacks so could you tell me a little bit about what that video is sure so a lot of people will take d3 that's fine. I, I don't recommend it unless you absolutely need it, in which case, fine. Go for it. Uh, I Just for the record, I, I do have vitamin D. Um, I only take it when I'm traveling and I'm basically stuck indoors all day or opposite time zone and I'm awake and everyone's asleep. Other than that, I'll just sit by the window, be outside or whatever. But D3 you know, is, is an information system. So it tells your body what is happening outside. It isn't directly what causes uh, changes to, to, to this pathway or that pathway. It triggers pathways itself to make end, you know, enzymatic reactions happen. And what happens is it triggers a need for other things. So, for example, one of the things you need with it is magnesium. And you've got to make sure that you get enough magnesium. I don't think anyone would disagree. It's pretty, pretty obvious. You need all the micronutrients. But when you look at what it does in terms of calcium, what it does is it, it can it can have an influence on the regulation of calcium within the body. And to put this into perspective, just so people understand, you, you can find any study that makes calcium look good and you can find another study that makes calcium look bad. So a study that makes calcium look good could say that calcium, when you supplement it, it increases the density of your bones and it can help patients with things like osteoarthritis, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. Another study would say that if you increase calcium, oh, you, it increases the amount of stiffening of the arteries and there's plaques in the arteries and, and calcium would get stuck in the soft tissue, which is not good. How can the same nutrient be good and bad at the same time? Like, how would we have evolved to have denser bones and stiffer arteries at the same time? It just makes no sense. Um, so the point of that video was for people to understand the right way to control calcium and that if you're going to take vitamin D3, you have to do it appropriately with cofactors. One of those cofactors is vitamin K2 because K2 influences the activity through carboxylation of enzymes like osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein. But simply, these make sure that calcium is in the right place. So it takes it out of the soft tissue or prevents its growth in the soft tissues and it ensures its growth in the hard tissues. So you have this process called nucleation but the non-chemist's nucleation is basically where you're trying to make a crystal out of a liquid. And so we can take calcium phosphate and we can turn it into the, the mineral component of bone, um, the, the hydroxyapatite. So most of bone is, is, is collagen and apatite. That's it. And then there's other minor bits and pieces, but most of it is that. And so what the, the, the proteins can do is ensure that calcium is growing like crystals, like a, like a crystal tree almost watering it in, in the right place, in the bone. But then you have something that can also make sure that that same growing process of the crystal stops that growing process in, this, in soft tissues. So if you want to make it grow in the bone, you might water it just like you water a plant. And if you want to make it stop growing in the wrong place, you might 
cover it up so it receives no sunlight and the plant can't grow. And so vitamin K2 allows us to do this properly. And if you just take D3 and it puts calcium in the wrong place, are you going to go closer towards a problem in your arteries which could lead to a heart attack? And that's what I wanted people to consider and, and think about. There's never been anything that proves, you know, if you don't take K2, you're going to get a heart attack. It's, it's not what the video is about. It's really just a biochemical look on why K2 supplementation at the same time as D3 is a very sensible idea. Yeah, great answer. And I think, you know, real life experience of coaching people, I had somebody in Arizona who was very low in D3, very low, long-term vegan, uh, but living in a desert. Well, that shouldn't happen, should it? <laughs> if you just believe everything's in isolation, but it's it's you know, you need fats in your in your system, and um, anyway, right? I'm not going to get into. It. It's not about me. There is the other one that was a bit clickbaity, and it, it's fine. I do that too. I'm already thinking, what's the thing I'm going to put on my thumbnail to make people watch this video? You know, it's the way it works. Sadly, um, was the facelift without Botox? Watch me do it. You actually say so. Just tell us a little bit about that, please, because that's fascinating. Sure. So the first thing to realize is that's not that different to longevity because what you're doing is you're optimizing cell function. And by eating the right diet, what are you doing? You're optimizing cell function. You're reducing inflammation. And so when we apply those principles in diet, you know, we get the carnivore diet. We get better health but we apply it locally on a really really tiny scale in specific tissues like the face we get other effects as well and we can do that i mentioned it earlier in this podcast um mtor and i mentioned mtor complex one and i mentioned the fact that it it, it reacts or responds to nutrient profiles well the way i did that in that video is by creating specific amino acid profiles in a localized environment, which changes the way the mitochondria work, and they engage the mTOR complex one. If people want something to look up, they can look up something called GCN2K ATF4. It's a bit of a mouthful, and I haven't made it up, I promise. It is a, it is a specific recognition mechanism for amino acid profiles in that environment, which then allows the mitochondria to do this rather than that. And what happens when you do that in a localized setting in the face, you allow the skin cells to generate all sorts of collagen because actually there's 28 types of collagen. Saying we make collagen is completely useless, which is great for marketing because then they can just say collagen and they can make just one type, which is not that useful, and yet it's actually still making collagen. Whereas when you do that locally using the, the product that I showed in the video, you can generate collagens like type 17, type 4, type 7, elastin. Collagen doesn't make your face elastic, it's elastin. You can also make things like fibronectin, which is extremely useful for wound healing, for organizing collagen fibers. And so when you do that in, in that way, you can actually tighten the face in a way that you can't with other products because col products that just make collagen will mostly, mostly, mainly or mostly only make collagen types one and or three. Three actually gets converted into one over time anyway. And one is not utilized in the actual tightening of skin. You've got two layers of skin, epidermis on top, dermis on below. And the way they link into each other is a bit like two people shaking hands. There's a, there's a mechanism there. You've got the fingers connected to the wrist, connected to the arm, the elbow, blah, blah, blah. And the epidermis to the dermis is connected in the same way. You've got different types of collagens all linking to each other to form this handshake. One and three are not in that handshake, actually. They're, one and threes are in that second layer, dermis. These other types are between the layers. Like a, like a toothpick going through a burger to keep everything still. So was, that video was to show that product, which is kind of like the injectable version of the carnivore diet, if you like, because it uses no active ingredients. It's just amino acids in specific ratios that elicit certain responses from the mitochondria in the sense that when you have a carnivore diet and you have good protein intake, you got no toxic carbohydrates in there, you are also going to elicit a certain response from your body. So it's a, it's a sort of scaled down, super small scale version of, of the carnivore diet almost. Brilliant. Yes. And I'll put links in the description to your sure. YouTube Thank you. channel so people can look that up. Fascinating. I also like some practical tips. I mean, one of the reasons I think you're particularly interesting is you've got a nice mix of analogies that are really basic, common sense, a little bit of science great it's all really good and it, it, like you say everything can be looked up i'm big into that because everything i talk about i put references in and always allow people to comment and if i have a negative comment i leave it and let people just uh, ruminate over what someone's saying i always respond 
And I think it's it's the best way to be, to just say, right, okay, this is what you think. Let's investigate that. Why do you say that? Um, so I've got a couple of very basic questions for people that go to carnivore. They have a few issues when they first start. Uh, why do you think some people suffer with a little bit of fatigue early on in their journey? So I think part of it is it's probably the electrolytes not being quite correct. Um, fatigue is not just about having enough macronutrients. It's also to do with the micronutrients. Now, of course, this is individual. You've got to look at everyone as an individual. It's, it's, it's a word of my job. But as a, as a general thing that might be applicable to everyone, I would say electrolytes are probably going to be one of the things. So when you go carnivore, you're going to have less insulin spikes because there's less carbohydrates. I think that's pretty obvious to most people. But when you have less insulin spikes, that will actually change the the electrolytes in your body in terms of how much you're getting and, and what they're going to be doing without getting too complex. And so what you might need to do is supplement with electrolytes for a time until your body adapts to what, what you're going through. And at that point, then things should start to normalize from there. Excellent. Some people suffer with um, not being able to sleep. Why do you think that might be? That's a good question. I mean, sometimes you've got a question, is it actually not sleeping in inverted commas or is it that they are sleeping and that's all they need? And when I see patients for this, that's that's the big that's the big thing I look for. Um, I found that, you know, I do sleep less now, but I haven't got a problem during the day of falling asleep. So I suspect what's happening is we don't need as much sleep because there's less inflammatory process in our body for us to to deal with. Um, in terms of things that people can do to help, I think, you know, stay grounded during the day. That seems to to help quite a lot. I would make sure that you have enough vitamin D, get enough sunshine on your skin. Uh, sleep seems to be highly correlated. Sure, correlated is a key word, not causal, but seems to be correlated to getting good quality vitamin D. And also making sure that you've got enough zinc and magnesium. I think that's crucial, um, specifically in, in a bioavailable form. So magnesium informs that end with the letters A-T-E, citrate as an example is, is very bioavailable, and glycinate or bisglycinate, that's another one, um, and then zinc, some kind of chelate, you can even get zinc glycinate or zinc bisglycinate as well. You have that on an empty stomach before bed, uh, and it's going to allow your sleep to be a little bit deeper and, and a, bit, a little bit better quality as well. But people that need to not just look at sleep in isolation, you may have less sleep, but what are your symptoms during the day? If there are no symptoms and you're doing great and, you, and your gym's great, you're getting great gains, you're, you're not falling asleep at work, you're, you're performing well, actually there's, there's nothing to worry about. You probably just need less sleep and that's all it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very analogous to, to pooping because you poop less because there's less need for it. And I categorically had at least once a month someone say, I've got constipation. And when we do the coaching call, they haven't got constipation. They're just going less. They have no pains, they have no symptoms, there's no smell, there's no gas. Um, and it's just, well, you're eating the right food. Your body is not ejecting this food because it's, well, it's not fiber, it's not indigestible. It's digestible and it's bioavailable and it's being used. So that's, that's a great answer. I'm going to ask you one more sort of biohack, simple question. Some people also get cramps. It's not all the same person, by the way, <laughs> reporting these. What about cramps and normally in the legs? So again, cramps, are, I think, are going to be highly related to electrolytes as well. Um, looking at the contraction of, of actin and myosin filaments in the muscle, which is what you might call sliding filament theory, we're highly dependent on things like calcium to move the, you know, the binding head out of the way for the actin and myosin. Um, signaling mechanisms always use electrolytes in there. So I would again suggest that they have enough electrolytes in there. Uh, I know Richard from Keto Pro has a really nice electrolyte blend. I've, I've not sponsored just in case anyone's wondering, but I have just ordered some and I can't wait to try them. Um, there are a few good ones. Also, making sure that you salt your food. Um, if you are used to never salting food and you go carnivore, that's a habit you're going to have to change because you need to make sure you've got enough of these in there. Uh, there are a few good salts. My personal preference would be something like Celtic sea salt. Um, another two, if people want to try something different, would be something like Himalayan pink or Redmond's. Some people are a little bit against Himalayan pink for various reasons. I've got no problem with that at all. I think they're perfectly valid. Um, some people aren't a huge fan of Redmond's as well for other reasons. And I do understand why, like these salts, they have all these minerals, but then you have to question what is the heavy metal content as well. 
Um, and, and But for me personally, I think Celtic sea salt is pretty good. Uh, no issues with that whatsoever. So I will always make sure that I have that with me. If I go to a restaurant, I'll take a little shaker with me and have that in there. And I've never actually suffered with cramps after going carnivore because I knew from the start I would have to use plenty of salt and electrolytes. But I found that patients of mine who we, we, whose diet we look at and we change, once we start to address the electrolytes, the cramping kind of stops pretty quickly. Now, if you want like an emergency way to stop the, the cramping, just so you've got it on hand, um, I I've never tried this myself, but I believe if you take a, gar a, gar a jar of pickled gherkins and you were to drink the juice of it, I've heard... I just, I've heard, I haven't tried it. I've heard that within like a minute or something like that, the cramp stops straight away because of the amount of sodium that's in there. So maybe that's something people want to try. If you tried it, comment on the on the video below and uh, let us know. That's great. Uh, another tip I heard was actually contracting your abdominal muscles. Uh, and apparently that works as well. So I'm going to ask you two final questions. Uh, sure. One is very geeky, sciencey, and the other one is really practical. Um, what are your views on hydrogen water or deuterium depleted water? Okay. First of all, I don't think there's any long-term evidence on, on it at all. And, and there's no evidence for any longevity as well. Now, some people will say there are antioxidant properties. It can act as an antioxidant, you know, neutralizing free radicals and things like that. Some people will point to anti-inflammatory effects. Um, you know, it, it can potentially can modulate cell signaling as well. It's very difficult to speak factually on this because I, I personally have not seen any hard evidence for it. I think deuterium, yes, is is an, an, a known issue. I think Sarah Pugh, I think, is someone who's, who's a bit of an expert on that. Um, I haven't tried it, so I can't speak from personal experience, but I wouldn't doubt it because it, the, the mechanistic logic behind it doesn't make steps. Now, people that don't know what deuterium is, it's, it's heavy water, if you like. Um, if you want to go one step further, if you want to go one step heavier, then you're looking at something like tritium. It's basically to do with the, the atomic nucleus of the hydrogen that's in there. Um, because I'm, I haven't tried it, I, I'm not going to speak from experience, but I would say Sarah Pugh's the one to look at for a really deep answer on that topic. Well, that's perfect because uh, I did an interview with her and it's on my channel if you want to check that out. And the last one, the easiest question is what do you do? What do you eat? Is it OMAD, too mad? What's your favorite food? Um, when when do you eat? So when is whenever I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I eat very intuitively and I just eat what I like. That, that is as simple as that, which turns out to be mostly beef, muscle meat, uh, and then some pork muscle meat. Uh, and, and that's mostly it and now and again i'll have eggs i might have bacon and my pork sausages uh, i'm not a big fan of lamb just because of the taste that's all i've got nothing against it from from a health perspective but just the taste i love beef and pork so that's that's what i stick to and then in terms of my dairy uh, i will have milk now and again whole milk uh, i mostly actually just have that for protein shakes because i prefer the shake with with milk rather than water uh, and again the protein shakes only really when i'm traveling and, and i can't get proper food in um, and then I will have cheese now and again, probably cheddar is the most common just because it's easiest to find. And I think that's pretty much it. I'll then have Celtic sea salt. Typically I have sparkling water because I just like the, the fizziness of the taste rather than normal water. And that's, that's basically my entire diet. I eat when I'm hungry and when I'm full, I stop. That's all. Great stuff. Uh, I might prompt you with a couple of other things maybe we could cover, which is, do you eat fish and do you yeah, eat yeah. Oh, you eat fish and you eat organ meats? So fish, um, I do have, not because I try to force myself into having it. Um, just if I feel like it on the off chance, most likely I'll probably just have some salmon. Um, simply just because of the taste. I like it now and again. Um, and that's it. Very, very rarely though. Um, in terms of organ meats, again, I'm not a huge fan. Not because I think they're bad for you. Just taste, personal taste. If I do have it, I'll probably have liver maybe once every six months. Something along those lines. I don't think you need... I don't think you need, in inverted commas, liver more than that, because I think there is a lot in there. You know, liver contains not just good stuff, but but toxins as well, potentially. Um, and that's pretty much all the organ meat that I have now and again. I don't eat hearts or, or brain or offal or anything like that. Excellent. Dr. Epps, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.